Good morning. I hope everyone has had a good Thanksgiving, a good break, and a chance to enjoy family. And it's good to be with you today to worship together and to search the scriptures to see what he has to say to us. For the next five weeks, I want us to be looking into the topic of mission and our calling for mission. God has made us for mission. When we look into the scriptures, we see Jesus certainly is a man with a mission. But throughout the scriptures, we see that God is a God who reaches out and ministers. I have a brief sermon today, and it has the title, We Are Called. And it's taken from a brief passage in the Gospel according to Matthew. If you wish to turn to chapter 9 of Matthew, we get to see an interaction as Jesus is walking along. It begins in chapter 9 with the, the word that Jesus gets into a boat. And he crosses over to a place where there's a large crowd of people, and they bring to Jesus a paralyzed man lying on a bed. And the scriptures say that when Jesus saw their faith, he went to the paralytic and said to him, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Now, there were some scribes in the audience there, and the scriptures say the scribes started talking among themselves, saying, This man is blaspheming. They thought, Well, who can for forgive sins but God alone. The text says, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Now that's the setting of the little story that I want to share with you today. The text I want to look at is the brief account that is from verses 9 really do need my glasses at this occasion, 9 through 12, actually 9 through 13. In this little text, we see an interaction that Jesus has with Matthew. Now, there are several other accounts, and you probably have a footnote in your Bible there, or perhaps a cross-reference that lists some of the other passages in the Gospels that carry this same story. Today, we're just going to dwell here in Matthew. But as we unpack these various verses, we can imagine what it must have been like to be Matthew. And he is somewhere in these regions where Matthew is seeing all of the things that Jesus is doing. He is seeing him heal people. He is seeing the compassion he has in the crowd. 
He is seeing how he interacts with others. And this must have raised a lot of questions within him. Matthew, by being a tax collector, he was on the fringes of society. He was one of those kinds of persons who would probably not be invited over for dinner, except to possibly some other tax collectors. It's not the kind of person you would like to have around. Now, this passage begins with the verse, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and he followed him. Now, it's just a short verse or so, but there's some profound things there. Jesus goes to a tax collector and he tells him, follow me. Think about who would be the most unlikely person <clears throat> that you would expect would follow Jesus. And imagine Jesus going to that person and saying, follow me. Now, perhaps that person who you think would be most unlikely to follow Jesus would have been you at some point in your life. Why did he call me? Why did he ask me? I was not moving in that direction. Now, that might not have been you. Maybe you, from the time you were aware of who you were and what was going on, you always felt it was natural to follow Jesus. Maybe you literally grew up in the cradle role and you heard Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So following Jesus was what you did. This was your life. Well, praise God for that. Praise God that you had that experience, but that might not have been your experience. Whether your experience was one of natural progression from childhood, or if it was a bit of a shock to your system because you were going in a completely different direction. Jesus gives each of us a unique calling, but whoever we are, he still calls us and says, follow me. Now, What we learn is that Matthew follows him. And in fact, one of the first things he does is he invites him to his house. Now that's not mentioned in this account, but look at some of the other accounts and you learn that it is Matthew's house where Jesus goes and reclines at the table <laughs> and look what it says well guess who's at the house there are a lot more tax collectors that's what you would expect at a tax collector's house tax collectors tend to know other tax collectors think about your profession you well you probably know a lot of nurses or you know a lot of real estate agents or you know a lot of scientists or actuaries or preachers. We, we tend to hang around a certain kind of people. Well, it was the case here. And Jesus was eating a meal with many tax collectors and sinners. Perhaps Matthew felt, wow, I mean, Jesus accepted me. Maybe he'll accept some of my colleagues. Maybe he will say something useful. Matthew had seen the, the astonishing transformation 
that he had on people such as that paralytic at the first part of the chapter. And Matthew must have been convinced that he could do the same even with people such as they were. That's what I want to start sharing is my first point. So number one, Jesus transforms how we use our resources. Jesus called Matthew and one of the first things that he did was to invite Jesus to come to his house. That would have been an intimate gathering place, perhaps a more private gathering place than, than the street would have been, where crowds upon crowds were following them. And you can think about also the resources of contacts <laughs> that he had. Essentially, Matthew says, okay, Jesus, come to my house, and I'm going to invite some of my friends, and perhaps you can tell some things to them that would help them. Think about when you became a Christian. Who were the resource people in your life? Did you invite any of your friends to church? Or... If you grew up in the church all the time, did you make use of the opportunity to invite people at work to a Bible study? Or did you try to, in a very subtle way, bless those around you so that you could so that you could shine the glory of God wherever you are? So God calls us and transforms how we use our resources, but then second, he also transforms how we view our relationships. We, as we follow Jesus, we start thinking about how can we bless those around us? How can we reflect the love of Christ wherever we go? How can we be used by God to be his ambassador where God has placed us? Each one of us has a different shape. God does not send us on a mission that is disconnected from how he made us and the resources that he has put in our hands or with the network of relationships that he has connected us with. There is nothing that God can't do and he can use us exactly where we are. We often think, I'm going to go to church on Sunday. And that's a wonderful thing. It's great that we can gather and turn our attention to God at the Lord's Supper through songs, hymns, spiritual songs, and spurring one, one another on to love and good deeds. A verse, a, a phrase that I like and I, I refer to often, that indeed we are to spur one another on to the mission that God has called us wherever he has placed us, with whatever resources he has put in our hands, with whatever relationships we have, and with whatever gifts we have, characteristics we have. What else does this topic say? It says, and when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why? Does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, you could call this criticism. 
You could call this ridicule. You could call this bad press, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Uh, how does Jesus respond to that? He says, but when he heard it, actually, but when Matthew heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now, the Pharisees ask the disciples, perhaps there was some very unusual dynamics happening in that place at that time. And it would have been unusual for tax collectors and Pharisees to join together under the same roof. But somehow Jesus brought these groups together and the disciples, I think I'm confusing this here, but when he heard it, when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus also transforms how we respond to ridicule. Jesus took advantage of every opportunity he had to teach about his father and about his kingdom. So it is that we are called to respond when we are ridiculed in any way or criticized or offended or given offense to, we can choose to take offense or we can take that as an opportunity to reflect the perspective of Jesus. Jesus always saw these opportunities as bringing healing to those who were sick, whether it be physically sick or spiritually sick. Jesus is the great physician. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick are in need of the touch of Jesus. So when God calls us to mission, he transforms how we respond to ridicule. I would like for us in the coming weeks to gain the appreciation that every one of us is called to a mission. Every one of us is made for a mission. He has given you some unique resources. He's given you some unique relationships. And he has called you to respond to ridicule in a way that may surprise others and say, why is that person so kind in a time where a typical person would be very offended. That's what is known as responding in a Christ-like way. When he was despised and rejected of others, he did not open his mouth in kind to them, but he laid down his life for them. And so he calls us indeed to lay down our lives in the same way as we follow Jesus. Yes, I hope you had a good Thanksgiving and I hope that the relationships that you had, the meals you had, the contacts you renewed and the new, perhaps the new vision that you've received from the time that you've spent for what the next season is going to have for you. 
we are living in times of change. We are living in difficult times of uncertainty with the pandemic, with the, the future of, of, of our nation. But think about this. It was for such a time as this that God created you with your own unique person that you are. And I'm excited to find out what God can do and will do with us collectively, individually and collectively to serve those around us that God has called us to serve as we follow Jesus. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, this seems like a very simple lesson, and yet how profound it is to, to grasp that God, that Christ has called us to follow him. Please help us to see how we are called to minister to those that you have put us in the midst of. Please use us to bring people to you. Help us to stay close to you and to learn of you and then go as you send us. Hear our prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope that you are doing well today, but if, if you are in a difficult period of time right now, please know that Jesus is the great physician and he knows what you need. You have the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ to support you at this time. I pray that this will be a time of spiritual strength and renewal for each of us. May God bless you and keep you.